you very much, Daniela, and thank you very much to John for this invitation. I'm very pleased to be here with you today and present to you some of the results of the OECD works on gender. You might be surprised that the OECD is working on this, particularly those of you in France know that we're more known for our very often called neoliberal policies, very much called often the rich man's club. This, what I'm telling you today, is completely against this image. And you will see that in fact the OECD is not at all what it is often portrayed to be, and that in fact gender and gender equality is playing a very important role in our work. I will tell you a little bit more about how this came about, because the story in itself, how this has happened and unfolded, is very interesting and teaches you a lot about how we can mobilize political support for gender. But uh, let me start first, and this will not surprise you, because the OECD, no matter what else I will correct in our image, is still about numbers. So bear with me as I run you through a couple of numbers um, concerning uh, gender equality in the OECD countries. Here I have brought with you um, the title of the cover of a report that we launched in the, at the end of 2012, which is a major affair, lots of ministers came, very popular with a then French minister of gender, um, Najat Barbet Kassel, who of course now is also promoting gender in her new role. So um, this, you can see, there's a big gender gap and um, the girls are trying to move up and the men, are, some of them are interested in helping, some of them are bystanders. So another one is kind of, well, hands in the pocket, let's see what happens. <laughs> um, as Anita already mentioned, um, we have um, still very large um, differences in, between men and women in the labor markets. Now what I have brought to you here is a breakdown of the different countries um, of employment rates, but the important point here is the small line that you see here, full-time equivalent employment rates. Because what we often see is that countries tell us, well, our employment rates are fantastic. My country, where I come from, Germany, very high employment rates. Well, nobody takes account of the fact that very many women work part-time, and sometimes only only very few hours. So what I, what I bring, what I have here are the full-time equivalents. So you really take, you we calculate the hours worked, and that gives you very large differences in some countries. And particularly, look, the blue ones are men, so very high numbers for men in some of the countries, but then the green ones are the ones for the women. And so these are huge differences. And for the OECD average, you have 73% for men and only 50% for women. And these are the numbers we should be looking at, and not only whether women are in the labor markets. And why is that so? That is what I'm going to talk about now. We looked at the OECD, we looked at what happened in terms of job creation. These are the numbers between, these are the figures between 1990 and 2007. Why 2007? It gives you a better idea of the trends. Because in 2007, the crisis started. And that kind of puts a bias on the numbers because many jobs were lost. Um, but So we wanted to look at the overall trends. And what you see here is that the employment growth, or the job growth for women, has been mostly in non-standard work. For men, the jobs created between 1990 and 2007 were 70% in standard work. Standard work, we mean full-time, um, non-temporary, uh, uh, non so, so permanent work contracts, um, not in self-employment, but standard employment, um, em employment work contracts. For women, 60% of the jobs were in non-standard work. And this non-standard work was divided almost equally between temporary work and part-time. Now, we have to be a little bit careful when we criticize these numbers because it doesn't mean that everything that's non-standard is bad. In fact, and I'm sure many of you would immediately agree with me, that part-time work is something that in certain phases of our lives, as, as mothers, we really like to have some flexibility for a while. But in many cases, part-time work is also a trap. And once you're in it, it's very difficult to get out again. And that is why we have to be careful about part-time work. And um, you have the breakdown here, and I'm sure the slides will be made available to you later so that you can look at them in more detail to see the determinants. And of course, I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have about this. 
Now, what are the consequences of part of non-standard work? And um, both of the previous speakers mentioned it. Um, Genevieve talked about um, the problem of having women in, in future jobs, in jobs with a lot of earnings potential, what we call the STEM jobs, science, technology, engineering, and math. And uh, Aniela mentioned the gender wage gap and the participation. Here I've brought you the gender pay gap in earnings for full-time employees. So these are only people working full-time, which takes away this, um, this effect of part-time work. And it shows you across the earnings distribution um, for the median. So the median earnings are where you have exactly half of the people earning less and half of the people earning more. So it's really in the middle. Um, and then um, you have the bottom 10%, those are the little light blue dots, and the top 10%, the managers and you know, the highest earning people, um, are the little gray uh, triangles. And you can see that um, the gender wage gaps in general are much lower for the lowest earning people. Why is that? We have minimum wages in many countries. These are low skilled jobs where you don't have so many differences between men and women. But as we rise up, the higher we get up in the earnings scale, the bigger the gender wage gap gets. So we're moving on OECD average from 13% for the lowest 10% up to 21% for the richest 10%. So this is something that should make us think, where does this come from? And if we're looking at the share with the highest 10%, highest 10% 20%, this is something, I think, which is part of John's mission, isn't it? to actually work on this and make sure that um, this, for the, for the women moving up the, pay scale, up the career ladder, that they do, do not have to suffer from such gender differences. Now, of course, we asked, where does this come from? And here we have some very interesting findings. The base here is a little bit different. We looked at year, yearly earnings. This before was hourly earnings or monthly earnings, but this is yearly earnings. So if people work part-time, very logically, they have less money. So the largest part, as we know that women in many countries work part-time a lot, the largest part should be working hours. But guess what? It isn't. In many countries, it's other factors. And so age, work, and experience is something that reduces the gender gap. Very logical. The more you work, the more you know, the better your market value is. Hours worked, it obviously, is also an, something that reduces, that increases the gender gap between men and women. Education. There should, we should be seeing much less gender wage gaps, as we know that now in many countries, young women are much better educated than young men. And then job characteristics. And here is where it becomes tricky, because we know that job characteristics are the non-standard standard part that I alluded to, public-private sector, and many other things where women are really at a disadvantage, accumulated disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis men. And finally, we have this light gray part, and this is unexplained. And this is where discrimination comes in. This is where it comes in that women don't dare to ask for pay raises. This is where women do not ask, how much did the guy who had the same job before make before I accept the new job? These are questions, um, how we present ourselves, how we put in value what we have done, and how we show um, uh, what we can do, and this is part of this unexplained part. Now, of course, at the OECD, we would love to explain the unexplained part, because this is what we're all about. We, we love to look at unexplained things. They're very hard to do, and this is one of the things where we would like to learn more about in the future, about discrimination, also not only women. We, we have a strong push from our member countries also to look at lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender issues, for example. Discrimination goes on for many other groups as well. So we have to find out much more in, um, in, what's, in what's happening in this great part. Now, what happens with the gender wage gap over time? These gaps add up as women retire. And we know that if you haven't worked in most countries or have you worked very little over your <laughs> active years, you will have a very low pension. And you see that the, the country with the biggest gender pension gap is Germany. Why? I told you before that in Germany, many women work part-time only a few hours, where you're not going to get a lot of pension entitlements with that. And so when women make, young women make choices about jobs, about working hours, they need to think ahead. Nobody wants to think about what it's going to be like when we're old. But this is the consequence of what happens if people say, part-time is cool, I don't want to work, I want to work only a few hours 
and then divorce, <coughs> surprise, low pensions, and old age poverty, which is much more feminine in all countries than masculine. Now what happens over time? Do we see change? Here are different cohorts. The different lines represent different cohorts, starting with the gray people, women born in, in 46 to 50, up to the generation born between 66 and 70. For women, the situation has improved. You see the dip in employment rates during the childbearing years. So it's become less over time. But it's interesting to contrast this with men. No change, just constant for men. No problem, have kids, no problem, go back to work the next day and stay there, right? So, um, one of the big things that the OECD has done recently is to look at the economic case in more detail. We wanted to know what is, what is the economic impact and Aniela has already um, uh, mentioned this. We can see here what happens in countries, China, France, Germany, and the United States have got for you. If we do nothing, if things stay as they are, the labor force participation, number of people in the labor force will shrink due to population aging. And a lot, look at China at the top left. In France, you have a better situation. In Germany, it's going down massively. And we simulated what would happen if we, if we do the G20 target, which I will mention, if we reduce to a certain extent this gap, or if we get complete convergence. And here you can see, if we put female talent to work, we have a huge bang for economic growth. This is, we have more women in the labor force and we have more people producing and larger uh, GDP growth. And for us at the OECD, for me, this was the changing point, where we suddenly saw rapidly <coughs> aging countries like Japan, like Germany, Korea, Italy, who were very conservative, and suddenly they came and said, we're worried, we're worried, what are we going to do now? We see this population aging happening, we need to mobilize female talent. And Prime Minister Abe the Jap from, of Japan put up front in his growth strategy that they want to increase female labor force participation. Now for France this doesn't sound revolutionary, but believe me, for Japan it is. So, um, I won't go into detail on this chart, I just want to tell you that we've also looked at the contribution of female employment to inequality, another big area of work for us at the OECD. I'm sure you've heard that income inequality is rising all around the world. One of the things that counters inequality is increased female labor force participation. And it works through different channels, which you can look at in more detail here, but um, that's another bit of good economic news for, gender uh, for more gender equality. Finally, let me just briefly tell you about two things that have been going on at the OECD. We had in 2013 a gender recommendation to, to promote gender equality in employment, education, and entrepreneurship. All the ministers of OECD countries signed this recommendation committing to a series of actions to further this goal. Um, where this came from was the report I showed you in the beginning, and this was done at the initiative of Hillary Clinton, who put this and lobbied very hard in, OECD, within her, in the OECD club with other countries to make this happen and kick-started this project with us. And in the beginning, everybody was saying, what are you doing about gender? That's really not very interesting. And now suddenly this has reached, with its economic importance, heights we never dreamed of. And here's the next one. This is the G20 commitment to gender equality. And for us, this was, I think, really a, an incredible achievement. Last year in Brisbane, G20 leaders decided to put a numeric target for all of the G20 countries on reducing the gender gap between in, in, in labor force participation by 25% by 2025. Now, you may say, this is not very interesting, who cares, it's not going to change my life and so on. But what it does change is that there is a high level, very high level, by leaders' commitment to this issue. So talking about lifting it up to the top, this is the highest you can get. And um, we're all very happy to be working with you on reaching this goal. Thank you very much.